In this video, we're going to talk about floppy drive support in Atari and correct the mistake I made in the previous video in this series. When I was talking about saving configurations, I said that there was no way that I knew to save a configuration that would be loaded the next time you run Atari. This is in fact not true. Me saying that is a side effect of the fact that I've never used this way of saving the config. So let me show you. We come into the Hatari preferences and I said this was the default Hatari config and it's not, that's the NVRAM. So when you save your config, if you save it into that folder, but call it Hatari.cfg, save that. Okay, I'm going to shut the app down and start it again. We'll load up and here I have four megabytes of memory and it's an Atari STE. So in other words, while it doesn't remember the last config that you saved other than the Atari.cfg, it will remember that one. What you can do is keep a separate config for each, like an STE, a TT, a Falcon, and then load it up, save it as the Atari.config so that, you know, the ongoing, it'll use that one. So that was my bad for me, and I do apologize. So moving on to floppy support in Atari, after that groveling apology. I think support for floppy disks can vary importance for people from not important at all to, oh my God, it's the only thing I need this emulator for. I'm more into productivity software. So for me, it's kind of just a, nah, not so much. However, if you're a gamer and you want to play the original games from a copy protected floppy, and you'd like to avoid having to use a cracked version of the game with a stupid hack draw screen, then it's very important indeed. And Atari supports formats that are both faithful renditions of the file system down to the sort of almost magnetic level to just a sector format that's very easy to create and use. You can consume floppies from other places on the internet or create your own for your own uses. The Atari supports quite a few formats. So the most basic format that there is for ST floppy drive emulation is the ST file format. It's a very simple sector by sector image of a floppy. It, it's encoded in FAT12 format, so it's almost compatible with the PC. It doesn't encode any special information, so it's it's not suitable for storing disk images that are copy protected. There is another format called DIM. It's not wisely used, but it's pretty much just the ST format with some extra header information. Then there's MSA. Now this is the Ma Magic Shadow Archiver format. This is the same format as an ST file, but it is actually compressed, so it takes a bit less space on your hard drive. That's not a concern nowadays, I don't think, but back in the days when you people were emulating PC, uh, sorry, STs on very low spec PCs, it was important. Then we get the next format, which is the, 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 the big guns, if you like, that's the STX format. That stores low level disk layout. It can be read and it will implement the same behavior for the floppy that the copy protection mechanisms on Atari products relied on. Things like sectors that are written in the wrong place or are not correctly aligned. These are very low level things. And they were designed to make it so you couldn't just copy the disk on an ST, but they're emulated. So you can copy it on an ST emulator. And there are some other esoteric formats that it supports like IPF, RAW, CTR. Um, they are again, a very, very detailed format that encodes low, low level data. And then at the most sort of lowest of levels, these things are ripped using custom hardware. There's a thing called a cryoflux board and it will read at the MFM level. So that's reading the magnetic information off the disc at the modified frequency modulation levels. So they can uh, reproduce any disc that was produced for the ST. And they play a vital part in software preservation because without tools like this, you know, there will be software that will be lost to time and the original magnetic media just fail. When we're creating our own floppies to store information on, we will stick to the basic ST format. 
there's no need for anything other than that because the simple fact is we're not doing anything fancy at the low level on these discs. At the end of the last video in this series, I painted myself into a, a deliberate corner where I tried to save my desktop configuration, but I couldn't because there wasn't a disc inserted to write to it. So what we're going to do first in this part of the video is look at how do we create copy drives. But first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go over the general options available on the floppy menus. So we have a drive A and a drive B. You can run this whole thing as if it only had a drive A. And that was the default for most Atari users. They didn't have an external drive. They just had the one internal drive. You can eject images and you can browse for images to insert. The interesting thing it, this option gives you is it lets you set a folder on your host system that will be the default place it starts looking for floppy disk images. Mine is set to the root folder on my Mac, which means I have to traverse from there all the way through to uh, the folder where I do store these things. So if you set that default image, it just makes using this thing so much easier. This option here is interesting, auto insert disk B. If you only have one disk, it will automatically insert disk B at the point in the app where the app requests it. Well, mostly it's not perfect, but for this to work, your images have to be called some file name A and some file name B. So it is very dependent on naming conventions, but kind of useful. Fast floppy access is exactly what it says. It sort of speeds up the way that it gets data on and off the floppy, but it breaks compatibility with any form of copy protection. And a lot of our apps just can't cope with that information coming more quickly. So it's just something to try but I personally just keep it turned off. Write protection is turned off for me, but you can have it either on or auto. I usually will run with it on unless I'm loading a disk that I actually created myself, simply because there are viruses, right? And the funny thing is, you know, you'd say, ah, well, it's just an emulator. What does that matter? A lot of times you're downloading disks from sites that archive them. Some of those disks with perhaps cover disks, things like that. And those disks can contain faithfully reproduced viruses, right? The viruses are on the cover disk. They're now going to be on your computer. Not such an issue if you're running off floppy drives, but often if you're running on a hard drive, you don't want some stupid virus corrupting your hard drive because then you have to start from scratch and it's just a pain. The last option on here is to create a blank image. Let's do that. I'm going to create a blank image and I'm just going to call that data. Why not? And I'm going to create it. It's going to ask me where to save it. Again, I haven't set my route, so I'm going to end up traversing through all of this rubbish. I regret. It's got desktop Atari. I'm going to save it in the same folder that it was there before. Now we have to give it a name. Important thing to note is let's call it data image dot. ST. So it only supports two formats, which is ST and MSA. If you get the format name wrong, it will give you an ST error message and you have to start again. Okay, we're done. Insert last created disk two. I'm going to insert that into drive A. And then I'm going to go back to main menu. Right, so there's my empty disk. Isn't that sweet? So now what we're going to do is we're going to do what we did in the previous video. We're going to set the desktop. No, no, we're going to change the resolution. Switch that to medium graphics. And then we're going to save our desktop. No errors this time. And then disk A contains our emu desk.inf which is the desktop information file. I'm going to do a quick warm reboot. Or even the old one, but we'll do warm. And we're loading up. And it's read that config from disk A, and we've come up in medium mode. Notice it also booted slightly quicker because it actually had a disk that it could seek. And it didn't have to sit there waiting for a timeout to happen before it loads the default desktop. So that's creating your own content. And then next we're gonna look at consuming content from elsewhere. If creating disks was fairly simple, consuming them is even easier. 
what I've done in the meantime, since the last part of this video, is I've set the default floppy drive images to the folder I created on the desktop previously. That's just going to make it a bit easier to find these things, and it will show you how that works. So currently, we have the dataimage.st installed in the A drive. I can eject it like that. To insert another disk is as easy as browsing to it and selecting it. We have two. Uh, we don't have two. That's the one I created previously. So this is my ST image formatted disk. It's an actual public domain collection disk. I don't know if you can remember, but in the days of the Atari magazines would print in lists of different PD disks they had in their content, and you could send off the numbers and you could you could buy a copy. So I'm gonna load that. So there it is. Okay, we can go back to the main menu and OK out of that. And now my disk. There it goes. So this disk has two things on it. It has the Emacs. Well, it says Emacs. It's actually Micro Emacs. That's my editor of choice for, for config files and stuff like that. And a program called Stevie, which is the S-T-E-V-I edition. So it's V-I. It's not Vim, it's VI, it's, it's less well featured. However, both those editors are really uh, small and very, very uh, capable. And I don't even know, what's what's Emacs in terms of size? It, D, D, it, B, where's the info? There we go, info. 56K bytes, an entire editor. When we get to talk about hard drives, that's part of the reason you don't need large hard drives on Atari's is the programs themselves were tiny, teeny tiny things. That's how you load and mount a disk. But one thing that's not apparent, but actually really, really useful, is that you don't have to, I'm going to reject that, you don't have to unzip your disk. So this ST formatted disk would have originally been in a zip file when I downloaded it from the site and I unzipped it, but you can. You can mount the zip, or you can mount the file from within the zip. Go back to the main menu, go OK. This will now contain the battle zone program while accessing a floppy image from within a zip file. It's not going to save you masses of space on disk. Let's just have a quick look at what it is actually saving you. If I go into games in here, all right, so I have it extracted and I have it plain, which is good. I just go into disk view. It's going from 369 kilobytes to 51 kilobytes. I mean, it's a factor of six times, I guess, uh, smaller. So it's not without worth, but even if you had tens of thousands of ST files, you're still not taking up gobs of space on your hard drive, but it's just useful. Uh, it saves you a step of actually unzipping them. And as you can see from the selector, when you load a zip file, if there are multiple different ones inside of it, you can select the file from within. All very useful, all very good. Since I'm trying to keep these videos to under 15 minutes if I can, I think that gives us a nice point to stop this video and in the next video we will cover hard drives and booting from hard drives so thank you very much for watching and i'll talk to you soon